dusk, Easter Sunday. Navy SEAL snipers take aim at three targets. Three simultaneous shots. And a sudden end to the 96-hour standoff that shocked the world. A hijacked ship. Somali pirates. And a captain held at gunpoint. Now, for the first time, the story you haven't heard. Stunning new footage of the actual rescue as it played out on the high seas. The unsung heroes. I heard over the PA that pirates are aboard the ship. I thought it was very possible that, that Captain Phillips could have been shot. Is this saying what I'm going to do? Now, see it through their eyes. Several of us wanted to kill him immediately, including me. The pirate-infested waters of the Indian Ocean. 275 miles off the coast of Somalia, aboard the Maersk, Alabama. Captain Richard Phillips and Chief Mate Shane Murphy notice an alarming blip on the radar. Right away, that raises the hair on the back of your neck. Right around sunrise and sunset, that's when 70% of the attacks have occurred. I caught a flash on the radar of just a tiny blip. I went to the bridge wings to try and see it visually, and I, I still couldn't see it. Then, on the horizon, we were able to finally spot it visually, and it, it was tough to make out. It was just as the sun's coming up, the, the lighting's not so good. The pirates are coming on fast. Of course, all we can see, it's a boat. Even with binoculars, you can't focus on who's in it, what's in it. He's bouncing, he's hitting waves. The vessel was closing fast, very fast, faster than anything we've ever seen in that area in the last couple years. In seconds, the pirate boat is nearing the danger zone. All captains set a perimeter out there when a vessel gets within that. We take action and they'd cross that magical line and he sounded the general alarm to bring everybody to their piracy station. The boat is inside the one mile perimeter and approaching fast. The vessel zooms past the Mersk, then doubles back to pull along the left side of the ship and match its speed. And it was just a real helpless feeling because you're just watching this boat coming at you and, and it's closing at, at a, a phenomenal rate. So that inevitability sinks in that, that this is gonna happen. The Mersk's deck is low to the water, just 20 feet, making it easy for the pirates to throw up a grappling hook. In just five minutes, the pirates are climbing aboard the Mersk. The alarm started sounding. Oh. It's like kickoff at the Super Bowl. It was just yelling through the passageways, telling everybody, this is it, this is real, they're coming. I could start hearing the captain over the PA saying that we have pirates alongside, shots have been fired. I heard bullets pinging off the outside of the house. Once I heard that, I knew we were, oh, we were in trouble. I was somewhere between fear, panic, and anticipation the adrenaline rush. It was almost surreal, the real case scenario, and uh, we were living it. Ten minutes after the radar blip. I heard over the PA that pirates are aboard the ship. They are aboard the ship. Two pirates are now on the main deck spraying bullets wildly into the air. Following security protocol, third mate Colin Wright is on the bridge calling an anti-piracy command center in the UK. This is Whiskey Delta Bravo 9985. This is the Maersk, Alabama. I tell the man on the phone, we've just been boarded by pirates. He said, uh, he said, oh, Seconds later, a sailor's worst nightmare. New legs, new legs. Get off the ship. 
Right. Captain Phillips and crew member ATM Reza are eye to eye with two frantic gunmen wielding AK 47s, the pirates' tools of the trade. You just know that when you got gunmen that are holding automatic weapons on you, it's just a matter of a little bit of pressure on their trigger finger to start shooting people. Get off the ship! What is that noise? Get off the ship! Get off the ship now! I thought it was very possible that, that Captain Phillips could have been shot on the bridge. That's when the level of tension really increased and people were, were really realizing what kind of situation we're in. The pirates ordered the captain to stop the ship so two other hijackers can come aboard in the choppy seas. With four pirates now aboard, their first order of business is finding out where the Mursk is from. Captain Phillips told them it's a USA vessel, and once they found out it was a US flag vessel, they, yeah, oh, they all celebrated. They were so excited to find out that they had gotten a USA ship. Each American life means an even bigger payday. They've hit the lottery. The next order was to bring the entire crew to the bridge. Call your crew, bring your crew here now. He wants everybody here now. And he says, if that doesn't happen, boom. He said, my friend wants to start shooting. And he's told the captain, you've got two minutes to have the crew. This is the captain. I need all crew on the bridge. I need all crew on the bridge immediately. Do you understand? But the crew doesn't come. We knew that it was just a delaying tactic. Because not one time did he give the all clear password that we'd established. But how long could they delay? Do you understand? I need all crew on the bridge. This is urgent. And then it got down to a minute, and nobody had come. And, and I'm thinking, when he starts shooting, he's going to shoot me. It got down to 30 seconds. And this is really sweating time. Time runs out. Still, no sign of the crew. The pirate's bluff has been called. And they don't shoot. At this point, I know that I'm in a bad spot anyway. At the best, I could be spending a couple of months in Somalia, hoping that uh, the shipping company will pay a ransom for us. At the worst, I could be killed. Five hundred miles to the east, the destroyer USS Bainbridge gets a simple yet puzzling command. Turn around and head east as fast as possible. Four armed pirates have stormed the Mersk, Alabama off the coast of Somalia. They hold Captain Richard Phillips and two crew members at gunpoint on the bridge their lives in the hands of violent, agitated gunmen. But the remaining crew put a plan in place. Following training procedure, most of them head deep into the belly of the ship. Here, a safe room offers protection from the pirates. Also below deck, a secret weapon. There's a set of alternate controls which engineer Mike Perry deploys, giving him command of the ship. Instantly, I took control away from the bridge for the main engines and called my first engineer to take control of the steering. Perry launches an ingenious counterattack. I ordered the first engineer to keep swinging the rudder port to starboard to try to swamp their boat. Wagging the stern creates an undertow sucking the pirates' boat underwater. Now, the pirates have no ride home. While 14 crew members remain in the safe room, two creep outside, ready to fight back. I would either die fighting, or I would end my life at my own hand before I would allow myself to be captured. 
Shane Murphy is perched inside the crane control room with a bird's eye view of the bridge and the pirates. You know, I've always tried to be been uh, a man of action. I've always tried to have a plan uh, and immediately started to enact that plan. In the engine room, Chief Engineer Mike Perry stays at the controls. To win this battle, he needs to confuse the enemy. So I turned the whole ship black. I wasn't going to sink the ship, but I was not going to let them be able to use it in any way. We never surrendered the control of the ship. The lights went out on our call, not theirs. Of course, they, once they turn everything black, the emergency generator starts, brings on emergency lighting, which say every fourth or fifth lights on. I didn't even want them to have that. But there's a problem. Mike needs to kill the emergency generator, but it's on the main deck in full view of the pirates. In my mentality, these people are gunmen. They will kill somebody, but I had to sneak along the side of the ship and knock out the, the emergency generator. Perry's on a risky mission to disable it. I can't say that there was fear, but I, I was very cautious working my way through the tunnels on the ship, up onto the deck. I'm moving very slowly, and I'm looking and I'm listening every step of the way. Uh, there's nothing running on the ship, so sound travels. Now they have nothing. The pirate assault on the Maersk was no isolated event. Since January 2008, over 150 vessels have been hijacked and up to $150 million in ransom paid. Nearly all activity was centered here, in the Gulf of Aden, off the north coast of Somalia. Each year, almost a trillion dollars worth of goods sails by this destitute third world nation. Out here, it's the Wild West, ruled by rival warlords and guerrillas who turn young men raised in a lawless land into hardened, gun-toting mercenaries, eager for riches. Once aboard a boat, a pirate has a one in three chance of getting out alive with cash. Often, millions of dollars in ransom are literally parachuted in. One drop totaled a record three million. To combat the piracy, a 20-nation task force guards the sea lanes north of the Somali coast. On the eve of the Maersk hijacking, Rear Admiral Terence McKnight was in charge. They decided to go after small vessels first, and then they figured out, well, if we can get small vessels, let's go try bigger vessels. And the, and the ransoms are being paid, and these people, I mean, they're just saying, hey, I can get $1,000 uh, being a pirate, I'll give it a try. The task force guards the seaways but they can't be everywhere. And in April 2009, the pirates shift their operations below the Horn of Africa in the Indian Ocean, attacking ships almost 500 miles from the protection of the task force. And here, they capture the Maersk. On receiving the distress call, the Navy springs into action, but the odds are stacked against them. We didn't know the condition of the captain. We didn't know the number of pirates. We didn't know about any of the condition of the crew. We knew where it was located. We knew where the closest uh, ship was that we could put onto it. Uh, and that's about it. The military's secret weapon is on the way. The Navy SEALs. As soon as the event took place, they started preparations. These were pirates. These were bad guys. And you need trigger pullers. The U.S. Navy used the best tool in the toolbox. That tool is the Navy SEALs. The Navy has to cover 300 miles of ocean. And the crew deep in the belly of the Maersk is in danger. There's no comfort, no ventilation, no water, no air conditioning. No, nothing. We're sitting on the equator and, and baking. The lights were out, and there was no ventilation, and it was extremely hot. 
about 125 degrees. We're just trying to stay alive. Uh, it's a dead ship, so it's heating up. And uh, we're starting to uh, feel like we're dying. The crew is running out of options. And for some, it's time for more radical action. Four hours since a savage band of pirates seized the Maersk, Alabama. The ship is dead, its power cut by the crew. Captain Richard Phillips and two other crew members are held hostage on the bridge. Fourteen crew members have taken refuge in a safe room. Chief Engineer Mike Perry hides out in the engine room, listening over the radio to what's happening to Captain Phillips. He's in danger, and I can tell he's in danger. And just by the tone and people's voices. Mike wants no part of being a hostage. It's time to fight back. That's when I realized we can't sit out there and bake in the sun, waiting for a day or two for somebody to come and get us. I need to move and go someplace else and start freeing people. Mike heads toward the one place he knows the pirates must pass if they come below deck. A perfect place to ambush an unsuspecting enemy. As long as he can get there first. And it was pitch black. I mean, not a photon, a light. But already below deck, one of the pirates is searching for the missing crew. With him, he's brought crew member ATM Reza as a guide. Then suddenly... I just step out of this darkness when a beam of light hits me. It was the pirate, and I turn around and zip down, and this guy is coming, screaming, yelling. I run down to my intersection around a 90-degree corner, turn around, knife in hand, ready to spring. He's getting closer, and I see his face just coming past the, the corner. And I lunged up at him. shoving my right hand in his throat with a knife. It's very sharp, it has a serrated butt to it, and um, all I had to do was move my hand sideways, it would have cut his juggler, would have cut his throat wide open. He's going into submission real quick. And in my mind, I'm thinking, where's the gunfire? Where is there no gunfire? ATM Reza had convinced the pirate to search below deck without his weapon. ATM quite skillfully said, listen, I can get them, but no gun. They're not going to come out if they know you have a gun. Raises trump card, his faith. ATM said, listen, I'm a Muslim, you're a Muslim. I will help you do this, but no gun. So there was no gun when they came in the engine room. Wasn't that fortunate? Now 300 miles away, steaming at 30 knots toward the Maersk, Alabama, is the destroyer USS Bainbridge. The Bainbridge was the closest ship asset that was available, and it was many hundreds of miles away. They are 14 hours away from the Alabama and still uncertain about the status of the crew or the pirates. The Navy must come up with a fast plan. Who can we get there the fastest? We can get a P-3 aircraft there. That's the one that we can get there as fast as we can. They'll try to get as much detail as they possibly can. They'll pass it back to headquarters, and then that starts the wheels moving for other assets that we have to move out there. Among those other assets, a team of Navy SEALs.
14 Maersk crew members have spent more than four hours in a dark, airless safe room below deck, sweltering in 125 degree heat. Just as they are losing hope, comes a knock on the door. And I heard a voice, a familiar voice. John, Dick, I need your help. I'm hollering for the crew to come out of the safe room. And I heard that voice give the all clear password. So we quickly took away our barricades and opened the door. And in comes a pirate. Then I knew that we were still in control of that ship. We had one of their guys. I grabbed my radio and I hollered over the radio, uh, called out to let the captain and everybody know and just said, one down. Several of us wanted to kill him immediately, including me. But uh, at the same point, we could uh, use this man as a, uh, a chip in our dealings with him uh, in possible hostage negotiations. So he was preserved on that, on that account. We didn't, we didn't want him dead. We didn't want him damaged. We just wanted him. The men of the Mersk have a hostage to bargain with. But will that be enough to save their captain's life? Nearly 10 hours after Somali gunmen seized the Mersk, Alabama, the situation has improved dramatically. The um, tides changed to our favor when uh, a prisoner appeared at our door. The crew of the Mersk, Alabama has captured one of the pirates, and not just anyone. We found out that he was the leader of the group, and right then and there, it's, we had a chip. And a problem. On the bridge, the remaining pirates are trigger happy and highly agitated. And now frustration sets in. They came on with a plan, and now their plan has been disrupted. And um, we're all wondering, what's their plan? And we're thinking, let's give them one. And that plan is an exit strategy for them to get off the vessel. Captain Phillips takes advantage of their desperation. I think Captain Phillips was able to suggest to them an exit strategy that uh, they find to their advantage. The plan, exchange Captain Phillips for the captured pirate down below and let the gunman take a lifeboat for a clean getaway. The pirates take the deal. It involved restoring limited electrical power so that we could operate the boat winch. Restoring power would not be easy and calls for every available crew member to help. But most of these men are barely alive. These people are in severe heat stress. In a heat stress mode, your brain shuts down. You, you can't think logically, you can't move. And this is a very dangerous situation. Every one of them should have been put in a hospital. Captain Phillips' fate lies in the hands of these men if they can muster the strength. But Mike Perry fears the crew risks further injury, even death. I'm very concerned, but I can't stop. We have to make this work. And I have to order these people to go to work. And one by one, every one of them, every one of them stood up asked me to repeat, you know, and then explain to them what needed to be done. And they walked up the ladder and they went and did it. And it was amazing to me. The courage, I mean, they were all in danger and they went and did it. You know, we just had this, this feeling of relief that it was still our ship, that we had not given up. 
The crew restores power to the Maersk, Alabama. It was like we got a, a sudden shot of adrenaline, and we were able to uh, shake off whatever coma we thought we were in and start to uh, get the plant going. Before the pirates leave the ship, Chief Mate Shane Murphy snaps three incredible photographs from the upper deck. These are the only known images of them ever taken. Then suddenly, the plan begins to unravel. The pirates lure Captain Phillips onto the lifeboat. I said, well, where's the captain? He goes, he's on the boat showing the uh, pirates how to operate the boat. The pirates have the captain at gunpoint before the crew can figure out what happened. It's too late. The hatch closes. Now they have their man back, as well as our man. The hostage swap has gone bad. So they motored away into the darkness, and it was just so surreal. And I thought, OK, <laughs> how are we going to get them back now? If there was the worst moment on the ship, that was it. Their captain is gone, prisoner aboard the lifeboat. And that lifeboat is headed towards Somalia. Six hours on the lifeboat. Captain Richard Phillips is being held by pirates racing toward the Somali coast. The Maersk, Alabama makes a valiant effort to keep up. Inside, the pirate's leader is wounded. The deep gash on his hand is beginning to fester. Then, for the men of the Maersk, a welcome sight appears on the horizon. The USS Bainbridge. The sight of that ship coming in at night, you know, uh, under the moon was one of the biggest pleasures of my life. He just felt like, you know, our, our, our guys are here and now we're in a position of strength and, uh, you know, we're going to get out of this. For the crew on the Maersk, Alabama, the Bainbridge will put an end to 17 hours of gut-wrenching peril. All the prayers and all the good energy that people sent to us um, in some form or another, I could feel it during the whole experience, and it gave me strength uh, to get home and to see my family again. The Maersk, Alabama will sail on to its original destination, Mombasa, Kenya. But their captain's ordeal is far from over. The pirates are not giving up. Here, for the first time, actual footage from the Navy of the lifeboat as it pushes toward the Somali coast. See two people the airport. It is 240 miles from shore, and the Navy knows what is at stake. Then we start working what we need to do to get the safe return of the captain. And part of that is to prevent the lifeboat itself from ever reaching uh, Somalia. If we let Captain Phillips get ashore, then they could they could hide this person any place. You know, we uh, we would have to send additional you know forces in there. After 16 hours on the lifeboat, Captain Phillips looks for an opportunity to make a break for it. And I thought they were sleeping. The guy up in the driving seat, uh, I thought he was sort of dozing. I knew I could get by him. I was watching the guy, I saw him put his rifle, his gun down, and proceed to urinate with both hands, and that's when I, uh, that was a, it was just a second decision, and I just went. So I dove in the water. I was trying to hold my breath as long as I can. I do do a little swimming, uh, but they were coming at me, and by then, I was just swimming toward the uh, naval ship. The ship is a half mile away. The exhausted captain doesn't stand a chance. The pirates fire off several rounds at him before he's recaptured, uninjured. 
Then they continued toward the coast. After two days sailing, the lifeboat is within 24 miles of Somalia. But the situation is about to change drastically. 58 hours into the standoff, a team of Navy SEALs parachutes into the Indian Ocean. The equipment containers go out first. They have their own chutes, and the men jump out immediately following it. That means they step off the steel into the dark. All they'd hear is the wind whistling past them until their instruments said, now's the time to pull and the chutes open. Then they would have only a moment or two. They're in the water. And they would hear the roar of the rubber boat sent out from the Bainbridge to pick them up. With the SEAL rescue team primed and ready, the Navy makes one last effort before employing lethal force. And what they do can now be revealed for the first time. 62 hours on the lifeboat. The Navy must prevent the gunmen from reaching shore with Captain Phillips a hostage. Rear Admiral McKnight offers a play-by-play -play of how they do it. Okay, one of the tactics that we're going to use to prevent the craft from getting ashore is we're going to use fire hoses. So you can see here from the Halliburton that they're firing, uh, they're using the fire hoses to basically push the, push the craft away. And when the fire hoses aren't enough, the Navy resorts to another tool in its arsenal, a Seahawk helicopter. Okay, here we have a situation where we've got the helicopter coming in to do a blocking maneuver. Now, if you've never been in a helicopter, this is very loud and it's a very aggressive. The Seahawks' powerful rotors generate hurricane force winds to push the lifeboat away from land while also wearing down the pirates' will to resist. My guess is they're inside there, they're just panicked. They don't know what's going to happen. Is somebody going to jump out of the helicopter? Is, is the ship going to run into it? So it's a very stressful situation. The Navy steps up their game. They then use the 15,000-ton USS Halliburton to block the lifeboat's efforts to reach shore. 15 the combined tactics achieve the intended effect. After 20 minutes, the pirates have had enough, and they respond. The pirates were very agitated. The on-scene commander got very concerned. Suddenly, the front hatch opens. The pirates fire directly at the Halliburton. But no one on board is hit. Nor does the ship return fire. Yet, Easter Sunday, 83 hours on the lifeboat. It's running out of fuel. And the pirates are running out of options. They send a message to the Bainbridge requesting food and water. This is the opening the Navy's trained hostage negotiators are looking for. At that particular point, you can work into the hostage negotiation process from a position of strength. The captain needs water. We're concerned about his, his welfare, so we're going to give him water. And it also allows you the opportunity to collect information, collect intelligence. In giving the pirates what they want, the Navy SEALs hope to get in return the intelligence they need to do their job. 83 hours on the lifeboat. The Navy delivers food and water to the pirates and their hostage, Captain Richard Phillips. Then suddenly, a surprising request. The lead pirate wants to come aboard the USS Bainbridge. He's injured. He was getting infected, and there's, we can't give him the medical care that he needs, so he decided to come over, and we gave him the medical care. 
that provides a great opportunity that splits them apart. You know, that gives us uh, a pretty good uh, upper hand on the hostage negotiation process. But it also creates uncertainty in the three remaining pirates. They look out, he's on the deck of the Bainbridge and he's drinking water and um, that's a much better life than being cooped up in that little tiny, little tiny rowboat. Once aboard the Bainbridge, the pirate receives medical attention and begins to talk. He says they're running out of cot, an amphetamine-like drug prevalent in the region that helps relieve seasickness. And they also face another bigger problem. The lifeboat is out of gas. Without fuel, the pirates can't make it to Somalia. Without cot, they're getting seasick. The Navy shifts its strategy and makes an offer. Now that they've run out of fuel, uh, they, they, just, they just don't want to drift. So in a mutual agreement, we'll say, okay, we will provide you tow and security. So we you know, basically try to take them under tow. 94 hours on the lifeboat. The deal made, the winch from the Bainbridge attaches to the lifeboat. The pirates think they're going to Somalia. The Navy has other plans. We're able to, to winch this thing in and control it, where it moves, where it goes in the water. So that is a major success. That success allows the Navy to set a trap. The SEAL team positions three snipers on the fantail of the Bainbridge. Unknown to the pirates, the winch begins to pull the lifeboat closer to the ship. Towing the boat allows them to control the situation even more. Closer gives them more precision of shot placement and they'll only hit the armed pirates, not the captain they're trying to rescue. The pirates have no idea they're just 75 feet from the Bainbridge. No idea they're close enough for a sniper to get a clean shot. Negotiations deteriorate. Seasick and agitated, the pirates grow more aggressive. One of the pirates um, was holding an AK-47 at the back of the captain. The on-scene commander got very concerned and thought that the, that the captain's life um, uh, was in imminent danger. Fingers on the trigger, the SEAL snipers await the moment when they can shoot. The guidance that we received through that whole of government approach was the president's um, uh, guidance and authorities that if we felt that at any point that the captain's life was in imminent danger and they had the ability to uh, disable the pirates, then uh, they had the authorities to do that. The SEALs get their orders. Kill the pirates to save the captain's life. The SEALs must choreograph simultaneous shots to take down the three pirates without killing the captain. They're perched aboard a ship moving in the ocean. Their targets are in a bobbing lifeboat. And there's only one chance to get it right. For a sniper, the ultimate stopping shot is the cranial cavity, the headshot. It does no good if they shoot the pirates and the guy can still pull the trigger while he's wounded. Captain Phillips has done his job. He stayed in the same spot on the lifeboat for the entire four days. The SEALs can avoid harming him. The snipers lock onto the heads of two pirates in the cab window. But they're unsure of the third pirate's position. The third sniper waits for a visual. Once he gets it, they can all fire. This is what they train for. If those snipers don't feel they can hit the target, they won't pull the trigger. Seasick, the third pirate pokes his head out of the lifeboat window. The third seal communicates. Target acquired. The pirates just went down. This is a covert operation. 
Only the snipers know the exact position of the pirates at this moment. They fire in perfect synchronization. The 96-hour lifeboat ordeal ends that quickly. This amazing new footage shows the just-rescued captain as he gets off the chopper. And I'm very, very proud of our Navy, and I'm very, very proud of our SEALs, and uh, I'm glad we got the captain home. Next to Phillips, their faces obscured by the Navy, two of the SEALs who participated in the rescue. These men will remain shrouded in mystery. They don't ask to be identified. They don't ask to be thanked. This is a great event for the Navy. It shows the capability of the Navy and Marine Corps team. And these sailors and Marines are just doing tremendous work out there. But there are those who we do know and can honor for their courage. The crew members of the Maersk, Alabama. Civilian sailors who stood in the face of a ruthless enemy, fought back bravely and triumphed together. Shipmate is not a term to be taken lightly. It means that we will literally put our lives on the line for each other. We, we accomplished something here, and I think that's the story. It was, uh, we didn't give up the ship.